The great British philosopher Bertrand Russell was once asked what he would say if he sta found himself standing before God on the judgment day and God were to say to him, Russell, why didn't you believe in me? Russell replied, not enough evidence, God, not enough evidence. Well, as I travel around North America and Europe speaking on university campuses, I think that most of the non-believing university professors that I meet would say pretty much the same thing. And this attitude then is in turn communicated to their students. There's not enough evidence. And in an audience of this size here this morning, I expect there are probably people who are sitting silently thinking in their own minds, there's not enough evidence. But I want to invite you to think with me a little bit this morning about what that means. What do people mean when they say there's not enough evidence? Not enough for what? Uh, not enough to coerce someone to become a Christian? Not enough to compel faith in Christ? Well, I think a lot of people take it that way. I find that most people are spiritually apathetic. They're either too busy or too unconcerned to be bothered about looking into spiritual things. Or if they are into spirituality, they may be pursuing an alternative spirituality, as in the New Age movement. But basically, folks just can't be bothered to look into the evidence for Christianity. And so in my experience, I find that most people aren't even acquainted with the evidence for the Christian faith. And this is particularly true of university professors. One of the most interesting aspects of our ministry is the debates that I participate in on secular university campuses. Typically, I'll be invited onto a university campus where a local professor has a reputation for being especially abusive to Christian students in his classes, holding them up as objects of ridicule and mocking the Christian faith. And we'll challenge him to a public debate on, say, does God exist, or humanism versus Christianity, or some such topic. And you know what? I find that while most of these men are pretty good at beating up intellectually on an 18-year-old in one of their classes, they can't even go toe-to-toe -to -toe when it comes to debating one of their peers. In their opening speech, they may trot out the standard objections from their Philosophy 101 class, and then after I answer those, they're pretty much left with nothing more to say. And so they either just start repeating themselves or else pushing the emotional hot buttons of the students to try to win them emotionally onto their side. I find that they are especially ignorant of the evidence for the Gospels. Many of them, I believe, have probably never even cracked the pages of a New Testament. A lot of them turn out to be just big, inflated, intellectual blowhards who have no good reason for rejecting Christianity or for ridiculing the Christian students in their classes. Now, in one sense, this isn't really surprising. Because, you see, all of us in the academy have to specialize in a certain discipline. And as a result, we're ignorant of things in other fields. For example, I know something about philosophy, my discipline. But I know next to nothing about chemical engineering, or economics, or agriculture, or what have you. And thus it's possible to have a perfectly profound knowledge of one's own chosen area of specialization, and yet little better than a Sunday school knowledge when it comes to Christianity. In fact, when you read the biographies of the world's great atheists, what you discover is that these men typically lost their faith when they were around 11 or 12 years of age, and they've never studied it again since. 
Now, think of what that means. That means that most of them reject Christianity based on the objections of a 12-year-old. So, when people say, there's not enough evidence, what they really mean is, there's not enough evidence to coerce me out of my indifference and make me believe. If I choose to ignore it, the evidence isn't going to grab me by the lapels and force me to believe in Christ. To which I say, of course the evidence isn't coercive in that way. But why should it be? You see, the knowledge of God is unique in that the knowledge of God is conditioned by moral and spiritual factors. A spiritually indifferent person can have a perfectly profound knowledge of physics or Russian literature or history or sociology or even theology, but a spiritually indifferent person cannot have the knowledge of God. According to the Bible, the knowledge of God is promised to those who honestly seek him. And thus the prophet Jeremiah said, you will seek me and you will find me if you seek for me with all your heart. And Jesus himself said, seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open. Ask and it will be given you. For he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, the door shall be open. And to him who asks, it shall be given. In other words, God doesn't force himself upon us. He has given evidence of himself which is sufficiently clear for those with an open mind and an open heart, but which is sufficiently vague so as not to compel those whose hearts are closed. The great French mathematical genius Blaise Pascal, who came to know God through a dramatic conversion experience at the age of 31, put it in the following way. Pascal wrote, willing to appear openly to those who seek him with all their heart and to be hidden from those who flee from him with all their heart, God so regulates the knowledge of himself that he has given indications of himself which are visible to those who seek him and not to those who do not seek him. There is enough light for those to see who only desire to see, and enough obscurity for those who have a contrary disposition. In other words, the evidence is there for those who have eyes to see. So, admittedly, there's not enough evidence to coerce you to become a Christian if you don't want to look at it with an open mind and an open heart. The Christian faith is not based upon compulsive evidence. But that's not the really interesting question, is it? The really interesting question is, is there enough evidence to make faith reasonable? And the answer to that question is, yes, of course there is. The traditional arguments for the existence of God and the evidences of Christianity may not be coercive, but they are certainly sufficient to ground faith rationally if you're just willing to look at them with an open mind and an open heart. Take, for example, this question of the existence of God. There has been literally a revolution in Anglo-American philosophy with regard to this question during the second half of the 20th century. Back in the 40s and 50s, it was widely believed among philosophers that talk about God was meaningless, literally devoid of cognitive content. This movement reached its crescendo with the so-called death of God theology in the mid-1960s. On April 8, 1966, the American Newsweekly Time carried a cover story for which the cover was completely black 
except for three words emblazoned in bright red letters against the dark background. And the words read, Is God dead? And it described the movement among theologians to proclaim the death of God. But ironically, at the same time that the theologians were writing God's obituary, a new generation of young philosophers was rediscovering his vitality. Just a few years after its infamous death of God issue, Time ran a similar cover story, only this time the question read, is God coming back to life? And that's how it must have seemed to those theological morticians of the 1960s. During the 70s and 80s, interest in philosophy of religion continued to grow. And in 1980, Time ran another major story entitled Modernizing the Case for God, in which it described the movement among contemporary philosophers to refurbish and redefend all of the traditional arguments for God's existence. Time marveled, and I quote, in a quiet revolution in thought and argument that hardly anybody could have foreseen only two decades ago, God is making a comeback. Most intriguingly, this is happening not among theologians or ordinary believers, but in the crisp intellectual circles of academic philosophers, where the consensus had long banished the Almighty from fruitful discourse. According to the article, the noted American philosopher Roderick Chisholm, himself no Christian, believed that the reason that atheism was so influential a generation ago was because the brightest philosophers at that time were atheists. But today, he says, many of the brightest philosophers are theists, and they are using a tough-minded intellectualism in defense of that belief that was formerly lacking on their side of the debate. In 2001, the secular journal Philo carried an article by a leading atheist philosopher at the University of Western Michigan lamenting what he called the desecularization that has taken place in philosophy departments since the late 1960s. He concludes, God is not dead in academia. He is alive and well in his last academic stronghold, philosophy departments. And so I am very pleased to be able to report to you this morning that some of England and America's finest philosophers at our most prestigious universities are outspoken Christians. I think, for example, of uh, Richard Swinburne and Brian Leftow at Oxford University, Robert Adams at the University of North Carolina, Dean Zimmerman at Rutgers, uh, Trenton Merricks at Virginia, Alvin Plantigan, Peter Van Inwagen at the University of Notre Dame, Eleanor Stump at St. Louis. I could go on and on. The idea that Christians are intellectual losers and nincompoops is an idea that is simply rooted in ignorance and needs to be once and for all decisively put behind us. Now, my own work as a philosopher has focused upon the implications of modern cosmology for theology. I believe that as natural science probes the physical universe, it encounters, as it were, signposts of transcendence, pointing beyond the universe to its ground in a supernatural creator and designer of the universe. For example, the evidence for the Big Bang theory of the origin of the universe points to the creation of the universe out of nothing. I find that most laymen don't understand that according to the Big Bang model, not only all matter and energy, but even physical space and time themselves came into being with the Big Bang. In the words of the physicist P.C.W. Davies, the Big Bang represents the creation event, 
the creation, not only of all the matter and energy in the universe, but also of space-time itself. But then the inevitable question arises. How could the universe come into being out of nothing? Notice that this is a philosophical and not a scientific question. The claim on the part of certain popularizers of modern science, like Lawrence Krauss, that physics can provide a plausible explanation of the origin of the universe from nothing, uses the word nothing equivocally to refer to physical entities like the quantum vacuum, which is a sea of fluctuating energy governed by physical laws and having a rich physical structure. It is not nothing. Properly speaking, out of nothing, nothing comes. So why does the universe exist rather than just nothing? The atheist philosopher Kai Nielsen gives the following illustration. He says, suppose you suddenly hear a loud bang, and you ask me, what made that bang? And I reply, nothing. <laughs> it just happened. He says, you wouldn't accept that. In fact, you would find my reply quite unintelligible. Well, what's true of the little bang is also true of the big bang. There must have been a cause which brought the universe into being. And by the very nature of the case, as the cause of space and time, matter and energy, this cause would have to be an uncaused, immaterial, changeless, timeless, and enormously powerful being which created the universe. Moreover, and here we come to the second signpost I wanted to mention, the evidence for the fine-tuning of the universe for intelligent life points to this causes being a personal, intelligent mind. Over the last half century or so, scientists have been stunned by the discovery that the initial conditions given in the Big Bang itself were fine-tuned to an incomprehensible precision for the existence of intelligent life. There is no physical reason why these fundamental constants and initial conditions should have the physical values they do. The inference to an intelligent designer of the cosmos seems far more rational than the atheistic interpretation that the universe, when it popped into being, uncaused out of nothing, just happened to be inexplicably fine-tuned to an incomprehensible precision for the existence of intelligent life. Now, some people have tried to avoid this conclusion by saying that we really shouldn't be surprised at the fine-tuning of the universe for intelligent life, because after all, if the universe were not fine-tuned, then we wouldn't be here to be surprised about it. Given that we are here, we should expect the universe to be fine-tuned. But I think that the fallacy of this reasoning can be illustrated by means of a, a parallel analogy. Imagine that you were traveling abroad in some third world country and were arrested on trumped up drug charges and dragged in front of a firing squad of 100 trained marksmen, all with rifles aimed at your heart to be executed. You hear the command given. Ready, aim, fire! And you hear the deafening roar of the guns. And then, and then, you observe that you're still alive, that all of the 100 marksmen missed. Now, what would you conclude? Well, I guess I really shouldn't be surprised that they all missed, because after all, if uh, they hadn't all missed, I wouldn't be here to be surprised about it. <laughs> Given that I'm here, I should have expected them all to miss. Well, of course not you would immediately suspect that they all missed on purpose. That the whole thing was a setup, engineered for some reason by someone. And in exactly the same way, given the incomprehensible improbability of the fine-tuning of the universe for intelligent life, it is rational to believe that this is not the result of chance, 
but of design. Now, much more could and should be said about these matters, but I think that this is enough to show that there is certainly enough evidence to make belief in God rational. But what about belief in the Christian God? Is it rational to believe in Jesus as the Gospels portray him? Well, Jesus of Nazareth has certainly become the storm center of controversy in our day, hasn't he? As radical biblical critics have said that less than 20% of the words attributed to Jesus in the Gospels are really authentic, that is actually uttered by the historical Jesus. But when you check out the evidence, then a very different picture begins to emerge than the one painted by the radical critics. In fact, did you know that today the majority of New Testament historians agree that the historical Jesus deliberately stood and spoke in the place of God himself? That he claimed that in himself the kingdom of God had broken into human history and as physical demonstrations of this fact, he carried out a ministry of miracle working and exorcisms. But certainly the supreme confirmation of his radical personal claims was his resurrection from the dead. And again, during the second half of the 20th century, there has been a dramatic reversal of scholarship with respect to this question. Back in the 1930s and 40s, gospel events like the discovery of Jesus' empty tomb were widely regarded as legendary fictions and even an embarrassment for the Christian faith. Similarly, Jesus' appearances alive after his death were widely written off as hallucinations brought on by the disciples' fervent faith in Jesus. This skepticism concerning the resurrection also peaked somewhere in the late 1960s and then began very rapidly to recede. Today, the majority of New Testament historians agree, number one, that after his crucifixion, Jesus of Nazareth was interred in a tomb by a man named Joseph of Arimathea, a member of the Jewish Sanhedrin or high court. Two, that the tomb of Jesus was then found empty by a group of his women followers on the Sunday morning after the crucifixion. Three, that thereafter various individuals and groups of people saw appearances of Jesus alive after his death. And four, that the original disciples' belief in Jesus' resurrection was not the result of their faith in him or of wishful thinking, but that quite the reverse. Their faith in him was the result of their having come to believe that God had raised him from the dead. Now those are the facts. The only question is how do you best explain them? Well here the skeptical critic faces a somewhat desperate situation. For example, a few years ago I had a debate at the University of California in Irvine with a professor on the resurrection of Jesus. Now this man had written his doctoral dissertation on the historicity of Jesus' resurrection. And he could not deny the facts of Jesus' honorable burial, the discovery of his empty tomb, his post-mortem appearances, or the origin of the disciples' belief in his resurrection. And so his only recourse was to come up with some alternative explanation of those four facts. And so he argued that Jesus of Nazareth must have had an unknown identical twin brother who was separated from him at birth, who grew up uh, independently, came back to Jerusalem just at the time of the crucifixion, stole his brother's body out of the tomb and presented himself to the disciples who mistakenly thought it was Jesus risen from the dead. Now, I'm not going to go into how I went about refuting this theory, but I think that it is illustrative because it shows to what desperate 
lengths. Skepticism must go in order to explain away the evidence for Jesus' resurrection. In fact, did you know that the evidence is so good that one of the world's leading Jewish theologians, Jewish theologians, the late Pincus Lapid, who taught at Hebrew University in Israel, declared himself convinced on the basis of the evidence that the God of Israel raised Jesus of Nazareth from the dead. Now again, much, much more deserves to be said about this. But again, I think that enough has been said to show that the Christian is certainly within his rational rights in believing that Jesus rose from the dead and therefore was who he claimed to be. So, while the evidence is admittedly not enough to coerce you if your heart and mind are closed, nevertheless, I think it is certainly enough to ground faith rationally if you're just willing to look at it with an open mind and an open heart. Now, our whole discussion so far this morning has been based on the unspoken assumption that becoming a Christian is a matter of weighing the evidence for and against the Christian faith and then making up your mind. But when you think about it, there's surely something wrong with that assumption. The Danish philosopher Søren Kierkegaard gives the following illustration. He imagines a young university student who's trying to decide whether or not to become a Christian. And so as to make an intelligent decision, he decides to investigate the evidence. And so he studies philosophy so that he can grasp the arguments for and against the existence of God. He studies comparative religions, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, Taoism, so that he can understand their truth claims and compare them with Christian truth claims. He studies systematic theology so that he can grasp that Christian worldview that he's exploring. He learns Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic so that he can read the biblical books in their original languages. He studies ancient history so that he can interpret these books correctly against the cultural milieu in which they were written and so on and on it goes until finally he is convinced that Christianity is true. And so at the age of 70 he places his faith in Christ and becomes a Christian. Now Kierkegaard said such a scenario is insane. Faith cannot be expected to hold its breath indefinitely while reason patiently sifts and resifts through the evidence. Rather, a God who loves us wouldn't leave it up to us to work out by our own ingenuity and cleverness whether or not he exists. A loving God would in fact pursue us and seek to draw us to himself. And this is exactly what the Bible says God has done. Jesus said, no man comes to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And again Jesus said, when I am lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. So when I said earlier that in order to find God you must earnestly seek him, that wasn't entirely accurate. From a human perspective, that's true. But from a broader cosmic perspective, it's really God who is seeking you. And it's up to you whether you will open your heart to his love and forgiveness or whether you shut yourself up against his grace. I mentioned earlier that when he was 31, Pascal came to know God through a dramatic conversion experience of Jesus Christ. That conversion experience changed his entire life. When Pascal died, they found, sewn into his clothing, a memorial of that event which he constantly carried with him. And this is how it read. From about 10.30 at night until about 12.30, Fire, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, not of the philosophers and of the learned. Certitude, certitude, feeling, joy, peace, God of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, let me never 
be separated from him. Arguments and evidence can help, but ultimately, as Pascal discovered, we have to come to grips not with arguments, but with the living Lord himself. Let's bow our heads and I'll close with a word of prayer. The Bible promises, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. And I would invite you to pray with me this morning. Oh God, I want to open my heart and my mind to you. And so right now, I take that first baby step toward you and claim your promise that as I draw near to you, you will draw near to me. Lead me where you would into a knowledge of yourself if you are there. I am open to your work in my life. Thank you for hearing this prayer. Amen. Stay there, Dr. Craig. Oh, yeah, please. Okay. You want to? We'll give our appreciation for the moment. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to try and manage the technology here and just pass you some questions that have been coming in so far. All right. So I've got a whole bunch of questions sitting here on. This is called an iPad, in case anyone's curious. <laughs> but, uh, can you um, let? Let, let's pursue some of these things. Um, a number of questions have come with regard to science. Yes. And so someone's asked about the scientific arguments for God. Are they valid given that science continually changes? Oh, well now the point is a good one that science is always provisional and tentative and will be revised as greater discoveries are made. But that doesn't mean that science completely turns over. Um, the Facts which have been established in the fact in the past will be recaptured in whatever new models science develops. Let me just give an illustration. We have moved beyond Newton's physics from the late 1600s, but nevertheless, Newton's physics still applies to things that are moving at low velocities. Uh, until you get to near the velocity of light, Newton's physics is still entirely adequate. So even though we've moved beyond Newton's physics, it's not like it's been abolished. Those factual elements are still preserved and taken up into the new theories. Now, it, with regard to the evidence that I talked about, or these signposts of transcendence, I think it's very likely that any sort of future physics is going to include the expansion of the universe and its finitude in the past, and also this fine-tuning doesn't look like it's going to go away. The examples of fine-tuning in physics are so numerous and they're so diverse that it's very likely that any future physics is going to eliminate this entirely. So while the evidence is always provisional, uh, that's just the nature of the case. That's the nature of the beast. You go on the basis of what the best evidence you have indicates. And, and might I just add another question? Uh, there, have been, there was a writer who talked about scientism. Yes. Uh, can you uh, comment on the dangers, perhaps? Yes, I, I would be glad to comment on this because I believe that this is rife in our culture. Scientism is a theory of knowledge. It's not science. It's a theory of knowledge. And what it says is that science, physical science, is the only source of knowledge. So that if something cannot be scientifically proven, it's irrational to believe in it. You should only believe what can be scientifically proven. Now this is the philosophy that I spoke of that dominated the 1930s and the 40s and that has now collapsed among philosophers who know better. Why? Well, first of all, this is far too narrow a theory of knowledge to be adequate. There are vast ranges of truth that we know and believe and are rational in believing but that cannot be scientifically proven. For example, logic and mathematics are presupposed by science, not proven by science. Truths of ethics, like the, what is good or evil, cannot be scientifically established. Truths of aesthetics, the beautiful, like the good, is also not uh, accessible scientifically. 
metaphysical truths, like the existence of the external world or the reality of the past, cannot be scientifically proven. These are metaphysical assumptions. Finally, even science itself, ironically, science is permeated by unprovable assumptions so that if you only believe what could be scientifically proven, you would destroy science. Just one example. In the special theory of relativity, it is assumed that the one-way velocity of light in space from point A to point B is constant. But we can't prove that. All we can measure is the round-trip velocity of light from A to B and back to A again. It could go out at one rate and come back at another. We just have to presuppose or assume that the one-way velocity is constant, but it can't be scientifically proven. So this theory of knowledge is far too narrow to be adequate. But the really crushing criticism, Andrew, was the realization that this theory is self-refuting. Just ask yourself, is the statement, you should only believe what can be scientifically proven, is that statement scientifically provable? <laughs> well, no. It's just an arbitrary definition, and it's not even a very good one. So that if you only believed what can be scientifically proven, you should never believe that you should only believe what can be scientifically <laughs> proven. It's self-refuting. And that's why among philosophers, this theory of knowledge is virtually, universally abandoned. Uh, and it's sad to see certain people educated in the earlier era of the 20th century who, who, who are still holding on to this. People like Lawrence Krauss, for, for example, who are scientistic. But you can confidently reject that when your mates tell you uh, that if something can't be proven by science, then it's irrational to believe it. That's helpful. Uh, there's a bunch of questions with regard to the Bible and Jesus. Can you, is there, uh, you pin, we pin a great deal on the Bible. Yes. Uh, what are the evidences for the Bible being a reliable document? <laughs> what are the proofs for believing the Bible? Yes. Now, Andrew, I want to ferret out an assumption that is underneath the question, okay? My argument for the facts of the empty tomb, the post-mortem appearances, the origin of the disciples' faith, doesn't presuppose the reliability of the Bible. Uh, it is not as though you first prove the general reliability of the Bible and then you deduce these facts. Rather, what historians do is they look at these documents just as you would look at the writings of any other ancient author, like Thucydides or Herodotus or Suetonius, and then you apply to them certain tests to try to find the historical nuggets in them. Um, and some of these tests would include, just to list a few, uh, multiple early independent sources. If you have a story or event that is related by independent sources very early, then it's very unlikely that that event was just made up independently of them rather than going back to a historical event. And events like the empty tomb are attested by five or six early independent sources, for example. Another criterion would be dissimilarity. If you can show that an event or saying in the life of Jesus is unlike the Judaism that came before him, but also unlike the Christian movement that followed him, then it's unlikely that that element was the product of earlier Judaism or written back into the record by the Christian church. Rather, dissimilarity would show that that belongs to the historical Jesus himself. Another criterion would be embarrassment. If there are sayings or events that are potentially embarrassing or awkward for the early Christian church, then again, uh, that makes it probable that it was not invented by the church. An example of this criterion at work would be the fact that it's women who discover the tomb empty. In first century patriarchal Jewish society, the testimony of women was regarded as worthless. And so it's actually a real embarrassment for the gospel writers to have to relate the fact that it was women who are the principal witnesses to the fact of Jesus' empty tomb. It would have been much easier for a legend to have Peter or John be the discoverers of the empty tomb. The fact that it's women who are the discoverers of the empty tomb is best explained by saying that they were the discoverers of it and uh, like it or not, the gospel writers faithfully record this. 
So what I want to say is that when you apply these tests, and there are many more, to the Gospels, these facts about the historical Jesus emerge as a result of the application of these historical tests. And among the facts established about the historical Jesus in the minds of most scholars would be the four that I mentioned, as well as many, many others about his life. Um, further to that, is there evidence for Jesus outside the Bible? There certainly is evidence for Jesus outside the Bible. He is mentioned in uh, extra-biblical Roman, Jewish, and Christian sources. However, I want to again ferret out an assumption behind this question. The assumption behind the question is that somehow the documents collected into the New Testament aren't really evidence. These are suspect. But things outside the Bible, ah, now that's evidence. That's really evidence. And that's a failure to understand what the New Testament originally was. Originally, there wasn't any such book called the New Testament. It wasn't until hundreds of years later that the church collected these documents and put them under one cover, and it came to be called the New Testament. Originally, there were just these separate documents written in the Greek language, like the Gospel of John, the Acts of the Apostles, Paul's first letter to a church in Corinth in Greece, uh, telling this remarkable story about Jesus. And the church collected the earliest sources, the ones closest to Jesus and the apostles, and put them under one cover and called it the New Testament. So for someone to, to ignore the documents in the New Testament and turn to these sources outside the New Testament is just historically mad. It, it's bad methodology. Uh, that would be to say we should ignore the earliest, primary, most reliable sources about Jesus and turn instead to sources which by their very nature are later derivative and less reliable, which is just crazy as historical methodology. So while there are these extra biblical sources, yes, they are not really all that important. They tend to confirm what the New Testament says about Jesus, but they don't really add anything new. The, the real question is how reliable are these primary source documents with regard to the facts I talked about? Uh, we've got a question here. Why are there differences in the resurrection accounts between the Gospels? That's a good question, and I think the, there's a couple of theories about this that are possible. One would be that the Gospel writers use different sources, and I've already mentioned that uh, as one of the ways that we test for historical reliability. For example, Matthew used the Gospel of Mark in writing his own gospel. Mark was one of the sources Matthew used. But that's not the only source Matthew had, because he also relates the story of the guard at the tomb, right? And that's not found in Mark. It, moreover, wasn't made up by Matthew, because he's clearly reacting or responding to the Jewish allegation that the disciples stole the body of Jesus. So he's responding to Jewish anti-Christian propaganda in telling the story. So here Matthew is working with a different source. Similarly, Luke has another source besides Mark because he tells the story that was read this morning about how Peter went to the tomb to verify the women's report. And that's not found in Mark. Now Luke didn't make that up. How do we know that? Because there's another independent source, namely John, who also tells the same story of how Peter, accompanied by the beloved disciple, went to the tomb to verify the women's report. So if we have these multiple independent sources, then it is to be expected that they will tell the story somewhat differently. But what you have in every case is the same historical core. Namely, on the first day of the week, a number of women who were followers of Jesus including Mary Magdalene, she's always mentioned by name, went to the tomb very early and found it empty. That's the historical core, uh, however differently these stories may be in their secondary details. Now the other possible theory for these differences would be that in oral tradition, what is important is handing on the core of the story, but you can embellish or tell differently the secondary circumstantial details. And so what you would have in the Gospels would be different oral retellings of 
the story. And I have a wonderful illustration of this. Um, in, when I was in seminary as a student, one of my professors told a joke. He, he said, did you hear uh, about the Calvinist who fell down the elevator shaft? And you say, no. And he says, well, he got up, dusted himself off, and said, phew, I'm glad that's over. Now, unless you know theology, you that's may not right. get the joke. <laughs> 20 years later, 20 years later, someone else said to me, did you hear about the Calvinist who fell down the stairs? And immediately, I saw what was going on. I said, no, what happened? And this person said, he got up and said, whew, am I glad that's over. Now, notice how it was told differently. He didn't fall down the elevator shaft. He fell down the stairs in the second story. But the core, the, the punchline, I'm glad that's over. That was identical. And that's the way oral tradition works. There is a central core that has to be gotten right in the retelling. But then the secondary details can, can differ. And this may be the explanation behind the differences in the Gospels. Can, can I put to you a thought and get your comment on it? All right. Um, am I right in understanding you're saying that at the very least, you can go to the Gospels and find the core is very so, so much attested in so many eyewitness accounts, solid, clear. Uh, some of the variety of whether there were how many women mentioned and so on, uh, you're saying it's not the core and so there might be various explanations for that. Right. Is, is that effectively what you're saying? Yes. Okay, cool. Got it. <laughs> um, because I would want to go on to say that the oral tradition didn't go very long. You mean that the Gospels were written very early? Yeah, 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 I think, for example, Mark is using a source for the story of Jesus' passion, the final week of Jesus' suffering and death. And this pre-Markan passion source that Mark used is very ancient and goes right back to the earliest disciples and is probably based on eyewitness testimony. So I agree with you that these traditions very quickly got written down. Um, but we, nevertheless, the, in, in a Jewish culture in which the ability to memorize and faithfully transmit large tracts of oral tradition, an art which is lost in our culture, was a highly prized and highly developed skill. Which we don't understand quite. Right, right. right. Yep. Um, uh, let, let me bounce through some other questions here. Um, wh why does the concept of hell only seem to exist in the New Testament? I would say this is a matter of what theologians call progressive revelation. That is to say, God doesn't reveal the full body of his truth all at once, but progressively over history. And the primary example of this would be the doctrine of the Trinity. You don't have the full doctrine of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit until the New Testament. Um, and also the whole advent of Jesus and his death for the sins of all mankind is something that is revealed over time. Paul talks in Ephesians about the mystery which was hidden for ages in God but is now revealed through his holy uh, apostles and prophets by, by the Spirit. So this would be a matter of progressive revelation as God's full truth is disclosed over time. And in the Old Testament, what you have is anticipations of the doctrine of the afterlife in the doctrine of Sheol. Sheol is the Hebrew word for this departed realm of the dead, where the dead go. And it is described as a sort of shadowy underworld, less than a fully human existence. Uh, but it's not clearly differentiated into paradise and Hades. That comes later where then the blessed go to be with God and the damned are separated into Hades. But even that is a temporary state until the judgment day at the end of the world when the dead will be raised and people will then be given their eternal destiny which will be heaven or hell. So people when they die don't go immediately to heaven or hell. They go into this intermediate state of disembodied existence until the judgment day when Christ returns and then there will be the resurrection and the final judgment. But again, you go to the core, Jesus, and work your way back out to these other issues. 
Well, um, that, that wouldn't be the way I'd put it. What I would just say is, again, so just, that God just tell doesn't... tell me I'm wrong. Oh. <laughs> Very no, polite. That, that just that is lovely. the way I'd put it. Um, <laughs> what I would say, to put it simply, is God doesn't dump all his truth on humanity like a dump truck yeah. all at once. He dribbles it out little by little over time until it's fully disclosed in Jesus Christ and the yeah. apostles. Yeah. Very helpful. Um, the Gospel of Judas. Uh, any ideas why it's not in the New Testament? Sure, it's, it's a forgery. It was written later. It's one of these documents I talked about that came after the New Testament. Um, there is no apocryphal gospel that comes from the first century after Christ. All of these arose during the second half of the second century after Christ and then beyond, the third and fourth century and so forth. They were forged under the apostles' names, and everybody knew they were fakes. So they weren't included in the New Testament. But the four Gospels were written in the first century after Christ, while the eyewitnesses were still alive, and they imposed themselves universally on the early church. Everybody knew that these were the writings that conveyed the authentic story of Jesus. Uh, uh, I'm conscious we're getting near the end. Uh, how do you explain miracles? I would say that a miracle is an event wrought by God or caused by God that cannot be caused by the natural causes that are present at the time and place it occurs. I'll repeat that. It's an event caused by God that cannot be caused by the natural causes at the time and place that it occurs. Um, and uh, if you believe in the existence of a God who created the universe, then as Peter Slezak uh, at the University of New South Wales, whom I debated, an atheist philosopher, says, uh, if you believe in a God who created the universe, then the odd resurrection is child's play. So miracles just aren't a problem once you've got this creator God in place who brought the world into being and designed the laws of nature. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm going to throw one last question. Uh, if you're sitting here, someone's sitting here today, and they're... Um, they're wanting to make a further step, mm. um, what would be your advice? What would you suggest to do next? Well, I would first encourage them not to go it alone. I would encourage you to talk to a Christian friend or pastor who can help to mentor you in this. And I say that because there is a lot of garbage out there on the internet, a lot of disinformation, and people who are self-educated run a terrible risk of unsuspectingly wandering into all sorts of bad scholarship and, and, and really just disinformation. So I would first do this in partnership with someone else who is a, a more mature Christian. And then the second thing I would say is start to read some things. For example, Lee Strobel's book, um, The Case for Christ, mm -hmm is a popular level book for beginners. It's very simple and entertaining to read, but it really is a substantive book. It's really got meat in it. And so I would recommend start with Lee's book. Well, friends, that's been awesome. Uh, let's again thank Dr. Craig. Thank you. Thanks very much.